So, take it serious. Don't be afraid to ask about suicide. And I don't say, so are you thinking of killing yourself or what? I mean, the question is, have you felt so down, so hopeless, that you thought life was not worth living? And if they say yes, certainly ask about it. Have you thought of a plan and so forth and refer them? And don't be afraid to ask about it over time. It doesn't plant the seed. It gives reassurance. Involve the support system and family with possible Discontinue substance abuse, that's, that's major. Remove weapons if you can, it's a touchy subject. Suicide hotline, I've given you the number there, and refer. If they say yes, thinking about suicide, absolutely refer them to the VA or someone and document for your records. Here's some recommendations. Uh, don't, in, information is critically important to these veterans. They've got to get what's wrong with them. That at its core, it's a bio, biologic process. They're not nuts. They're not weak. They're not cowards. This is a real process that they cannot control on their own without treatment. Not because they're weak. And that's what our book does. I'm going to give you the names of other books that we recommend that you get to patients. We know you don't have the time to do it. So, so information, and, and I've given you, in the list, I've given you links to the VA website, the Mayo Clinic website, that's got great information for our patients and families. The VA, you know about it, it's not your grandfather's VA. Also, most people don't know, after Vietnam, the vets wouldn't go to the VA on a bet. Many of them went and got blown off. We treat sick people here, you're not a sick person, get the hell out of here. And they said, I'll never, never, never go back there again. So the VA spun off something called vet centers. I bet you you have them in your communities and don't know about them. The vet centers are part of the VA, but they're not the big VA. And they're run, the vet centers, by veterans. They don't give out medications, but they can do therapy. Find yourself local counselors if you can, and web resources, and I'm giving you some of those in the recommendations. So finally, as you see patients, be sure you give them these messages in your own words. The condition from which you suffer has a name, post-traumatic stress injury, and it is as real as any other war injury. I want to add this, this conversation, should we call it PTS, post-traumatic stress, or post-traumatic injury, or what? I don't think it matters. What matters is they get that it's as real as any other war injury. They don't have to be ashamed of it. Two, it has a biological basis, and it's not something you should be ashamed of. You weren't born with it, nor did you bring it on yourself. Nor did you bring it on yourself. It's something that's a biologic process which becomes distorted and prolonged, a biologic process that was designed to keep us safe in times of threat that keeps on occurring now in situations where no threat exists, and that's not your fault. You can't think it away, self-talk it away, or even pray it away. My co-author in the book, is a civilian chaplain, Chris Parker, a female who spent a month in Iraq in 2010 in a combat forward operating base. And, and we talk a lot in the book about the importance of spirituality, not necessarily religion, but spirituality. And I mentioned you can't pray it away because people that, that get saved think, well, now I ought to be free of this. And it often doesn't work, and they get very discouraged about their religion. This is the most important thing of all. But you can recover from it by getting a realistic understanding of what it is, and by participating fully, by participating fully in valid and effective treatment. Here's the information sources. Uh, uh, you can, those are links. The other book that I recommend is called Once a Warrior, Always a Warrior 
by a retired Colonel Charles Hogue, one of the experts in PTSD. The third reference at the bottom is not a book. It's actually the Institute of Medicine study, which came out fairly recently. It's about 400 pages, so it's like a book, but it's got great information for any of you that are really interested. And there is a book there at the bottom, PTSD Principles of Diagnosis and Treatment from the APA. That's very good. So here are the pearls and the end. One, if PTSD is suspected, ask the four screening questions. Screen the questions about in the life. Have you experienced something so frightening that in the past month you've had symptoms of re-experiencing avoidance, arousal, or negative thoughts and, uh, and emotions? Two. In addition to providing pharmacologic treatment, which, which some of you may do, refer for psychotherapy, because that's really important. Number three, create a treatment strategy that identifies specific treatments, like for nightmares or like for anger, uh, and for comorbidities like heart disease, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, TBI, and the like. When caring for someone with PTSD, remember that it is at its core a biologic condition with emotional, behavioral, and physical symptoms. I want to thank you for, for listening to me. I know this is a kind of different question. Terrific. We have a lot of good questions. I'm going to let you walk through those while we do the post-test. So let's see how much more we know about this condition. So according to recent RAND reports, the percent of troops returning from deployment to Iraq and Afghanistan that suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder is approximately what percent? Number one, five percent. Number two, ten percent. Number three, twenty percent. Number four, forty percent. Or five, are you unsure? So go ahead and weigh in on that for me. answer is three. That's right, 20%. And how does that compare to what we were at before? Terrific. You guys are listening really well. That's great. Okay. Which of the following, uh, based on evidence-based treatment strategies, should you consider to prescribe for PTSD? One, an SSRI. Two, exposure and or cognitive-based psychotherapy. Three, benzodiazepines. Answer four is the first two. Answer five is all three. Or answer six, are you unsure? So let's weigh in on that. <laughs> Terrific, and the answer is uh, four, number one and two. Very good, and how does that compare to when we started a short time ago? Terrific, look at that, almost twice as many. And our third post-test question, which of the following based on evidence should you consider to use in reducing nightmares for patients with PTSD? Is it trazodone, number two, prazosin, three, sertraline, four, the first two, number five, one, two, and three, or number six, are you unsure? Great, and the answer is number two, Prazosin, and how does that compare? Very good, wow, you're a good teacher, Dr. Croft. All right, which of the following is a co-occurring disorder? <laughs> I will do that. PTSD that you would be least likely to encounter. Substance abuse disorders, number two, major depressive disorder, number three, bipolar disorder, number four, generalized anxiety disorder, or five, are you unsure? All right, and the answer is number three, that's right, bipolar disorder, and what is the uh, lip? There you go, you guys, a lot of you knew that beforehand today. And recent studies have shown the best way for you to deal with PTSD and co-occurring substance abuse is which? Number one, complete substance abuse treatment prior to initiating cognitive behavioral therapy. 
Number two, complete cognitive behavioral therapy before the substance abuse treatment. Number three, uh, initiating both of them at the same time. Or number four, are you unsure? So which of those? All right, the answer is three, both at the same time. Terrific. And how many of you knew that before we started? All right, a lot of you did. All right. And finally, I'd ask you to rate Dr. Croft's delivery of our education today. Was he excellent? Very good. Average poor. I know he didn't fail because we've just seen such a terrific knowledge lift. That's great. All right. And then lastly, I'd ask you, was Dr. Croft and our slide deck free from commercial bias? Number one, yes, it was free from bias. Number two, no, if you thought in some way we were biased. Please weigh in on that. I'm going to ask Dr. Croft to address your questions. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Uh, I, I've gotten some excellent, but I have 10 minutes, right? Is that correct? Okay, so I, I've gotten so I'm, I'm going to combine some of them. Uh, a lot of them had to do with medications. Uh, what are the doses of some of the SSRIs? <laughs> Why isn't Prozac in there? What about Buspirone? Uh, what about medical marijuana? We'll talk about those. So, number one, uh, the dose of, of, of SSRIs or SNRIs for PTSD are generally the accepted doses for depression. So uh, I would probably go, and I would go up to the max suggested. Uh, there's some interesting, very new data that shows that ultra high doses of SSRIs and SNRIs probably do no more because you saturate the serotonin reuptake uh, process and it really doesn't do much more good. But I go up to the recommended doses that you generally use for uh, depression or anxiety disorders. Um, why Prozac isn't in there, there was, uh, some of it has to do with the design of the studies and when the studies were done. Um, there's nothing that suggests that Prozac should be any less effective than Zoloft or Paxil, but that's just the way it, it worked out. Uh, there have actually been other studies that show that it works, and again, it depends. They use the PCL M, M stands for military versus civilian, and, and uh, some of the drugs helped some, but didn't reduce the scores enough. One of the things I can share with you is remember that, <clears throat> remember that response is considered 50% reduction in the score you started with. And uh, these drugs didn't do all that well. Many of them got to response, but very few, if any, got to remission. That's why we think drugs alone mm -hmm. don't work. Buspirone was studied. It should work, right? Because it's an anti-anxiety drug, but it, it, it was not a successful study. Why, we don't know. There's some interest in some of the new atypical drugs, which are alpha-1 antagonists as well. Some of the new atypicals, maybe they'll turn out to be good for PTSD. Who knows? Um, there's some reason to suggest that the lazadone hybrid may be good because of its mechanism of action working at 5-HT1A as well as uh, being an SSRI. We don't know yet. There's no good data. The, the, the stuff with cycloserine is kind of interesting because it has very few side effects, and it seems to be very good. Uh, this opioid agonist stuff, and there's a new one being tested that has no addiction potential, might be something cool in the future. Medical marijuana. Uh, it, it, the problem with medical marijuana is that it, I don't think it can be studied scientifically and the results well interpreted because of the politics of marijuana and the history of marijuana. Uh, the, the people, if I, I happen to be the medical director of, of a very large mental health website, 
and I go in and I look at the blogs and the bulletin boards, a lot of people talk about how effective medical marijuana was for them. The addiction potential, the, the illegality makes it problematic. Uh, does it work? It seems to for some people, but uh, there are no studies uh, that show productively that it does. Uh, an interesting drug that's being studied that you probably read about in the newspaper is ketamine. Ketamine, remember, was an animal, it was a, it was a human anesthetic that's now just an animal anesthetic and used uh, for production of, of, uh, uh, of, of effects uh, outside of the range of medicine, uh, especially for kids and adults. But there's some interesting data on the use of ketamine for depression. It works very rapidly at very low doses, not the doses that cause psychosis and hallucinations and delusion. It, it's very interesting, and they're studying it for PTSD as well. There was a question about diagnosis. Can primary care physicians diagnose it? I think you can. And I think if you use the the four question screener, that's quick and easy. You can do it in a way that they can do it. Uh, if you want to check that out, use the PCL checklist. It's very easy to use. Patients can score it themselves too. Does that actually confirm the diagnosis? Not necessarily, but it gives you a good clue. And, and if you're it, I was in Maine uh, lecturing and, and uh, you know, there's not a shrink in two hours from the place I was. So primary care is it, and pediatricians are it for, for kids. So you can do it. Comment on the disability ratings and reimbursement for PTSD. Uh, one of the problems, uh, disability uh, exams are called CMP evals, compensation and pension evals. That's VA speak. And the, the examiner has to be a psychiatrist or psychologist. Um, if you get a diagnosis of PTSD, my understanding is now, and they just changed this, you get 50% disability. Um, but I'm not sure. But some of the rest of it's based upon the severity uh, of the illness. Um, what about civilian PTSD? Is it diagnosed in the same way? Yes. A rape, assault, uh, car wrecks, hurricanes, fires, floods, uh, shootings, I mean, all those things can have stressors. Just imagine what I showed you and what you have in your book can have stressors that can cause PTSD. And if they develop the constellation of symptoms, yes. There's a difference, I believe, between a single event caused PTSD and an event that occurs over time, whether it be sexual assault or combat uh, occurring over and over and over again. Does the VA offer information for others, chaplains, uh, pastors, uh, therapists, and the like? They're trying. And if you go to the VA website, it is www.ptsd. Dot VA dot gov. You'll see there's all kinds of things for patients, for professionals, and it's really good information. And everything on the website is free. Um, what about what about kids that are traumatized in childhood? It's a problem these days. We have an all volunteer military, so in the mornings I see these kids from the MEP stations. The, evaluation processing stations for recruits. And, and lots of people these days have been diagnosed with stuff or have been through traumas in their life. Does that make them more of a setup? Yeah, probably so. And I'm out of time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay up here for a little bit. I wanna close with something that uh, y'all have been so much fun to work with and I, and I appreciate it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with something that I love. It's called In the Beginning. So in the beginning was the plan. This tells you about the government and managed care and the Affordable Care Act. In the beginning was the plan, and then came the assumptions. 
and the assumptions were without form and the plan was completely without substance. And the darkness was upon the faces of the workers and they spoke amongst themselves saying, it is a crock of crap and it stinketh. <laughs> and the workers went to their supervisors and saith, it is a, pile, a pail of dung and none may abide the odor thereof. And the supervisors went to their managers and saith unto them, It is a container of excrement, and it is very strong, such that none may abide of it. And the managers went to the directors and saith, It is a vessel of fertilizer, and none may abide it. Straight then the directors spoke amongst themselves, saying one to another, It contains that which aids plant growth. And it is very strong. And the directors went to the vice presidents and saith unto them, It promotes growth and is very powerful. And the vice presidents went to the president and saith unto him, This new plan will actively promote the growth and efficiency of this company, and in these areas in particular. And the president looked upon the plan and saw that it was good. And the plan became policy. <laughs> and this is how shit happens. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Cobb. Okay, we're going to take a break so you can uh, get another beverage or refreshment, wet your whistle, and visit our exhibitors. And we'll be starting again in about 12 minutes at 1025.